Hey, good morning. It's Patricia Murphy. It's Tuesday. This is Seattle Now. Summertime is a great time to explore the mountains, and Washington has tons of breathtaking peaks to climb. But things can change quickly. In a minute, Seattle Times reporter Melissa Hellman will tell us about what she learned from a recent hike on St. Helens. But first, let's get you caught up. Quite a finish to the hottest stretch of Seattle weather on record. Three 100-plus degree days in a row. That's a new one. SeaTac Airport, where the city's official temps come from, hit 108 yesterday. That's the hottest day ever recorded in Seattle, breaking the previous high of 104 that we set the day before. It got up to 108 in Renton, 110 at Fort Lewis, 85 on Whidbey Island. Note to self, work remotely from Whidbey Island during the next heat dome. And no surprise, the usually mild Pacific Northwest is not exactly cut out for this. The heat buckled pavement in both the northbound and southbound lanes of I-5. Saw some warped siding yesterday as well. SeaTac flights were delayed and power was knocked out in Auburn and Issaquah. High levels of ozone triggered an air quality alert, but that should start to calm down today. The forecast for the rest of the week, we've still got an excessive heat warning until tonight, but we'll only see double-digit hot weather. Should get up to about 87 in Seattle today before cooling off into the low 80s for the rest of the week. Those nighttime temperatures, they'll come down too, into the low 60s. No rain in this picture. It's hard to rival the beauty of the Pacific Northwest, and that makes it very easy to underestimate what's waiting for you. Melissa Hellman had always wanted to climb Mount St. Helens, so when her editor at the Seattle Times asked her to go on a hike and write a feature about the adventure, she knew just which hike it would be. She scored one of the last permits for June and set out. But in the end, she got much more of an adventure than she intended. Melissa ended up spending an unplanned night at about 6,000 feet on the side of the mountain. Melissa, we are so glad you're okay. Thank you for talking with us. Hi, Patricia. Thanks for having me. I'm glad that I'm okay, too. Yeah, yeah. What were your expectations going into climbing Mount St. Helens? What were you thinking? So I was really hoping that I would be able to get there the night beforehand, but uh, just because of my work schedule, I wasn't able to head out until the morning. Um, I was also, I also had insomnia that night. So I was expecting that I would finish as much of the hike as possible and get back to my car that night. Maybe I'd have to rent a hotel room uh, nearby because it was also about a five hour drive with all the stops, but I certainly was not expecting to, to spend the night out there. What kind of terrain are you talking about when you first set out? Yeah, so when I first set out, I was in a forested area. Um, so it's a pretty dense forest, um, and it was drizzling at the time. So um, so my, my feet were, like, squishing on the, the moist ground, and, um, and it was really pleasant. Um, there was, like, a, a nice sweet smell that was in the air, and, um, and it was pretty flat going in. And it's not that uncommon to start hikes in the Pacific Northwest in a little bit of rain, right? Bogginess is kind of part of the deal when you're hiking out here. So you're hiking along. It's The weather isn't fantastic, but it's fine. At some point, you encounter a skier, and that's where the terrain is actually changing for you a little bit, right? Yeah. So uh, after I hiked through a pasture of lava rocks where there were new new trees that were growing, um, I, I came across a ridge line that had uh, pumice rocks that had um, that was covered with ash, and, it, and it's a scrambling section. Um, and if you slip and fall on this, you could really tear yourself up. So I also had gloves on as I was uh, scrambling, um, and so it requires careful footing even during the daylight. So as I'm scrambling this area, I may be about three miles in, and I encounter a skier who's, um, who's right uh, where the, this ridge line and the snowfield intersects. And he stops and he asks me if I'm okay. And I, I told him that I was, that I was just heading up there. I got a late start. Um, and he told me, just so you know, you're the last person who's on this, pound, this, on this point of the mountain. Uh, so you're going to be up there alone. And, uh, and I told him, it's okay. I have my headlamp with me. Um, and he was like, all right, well, it sounds like you're prepared. Uh, just have a turnaround time. So I was like, yeah, I, I'm planning on turning around around six. That will give me at least three more hours or so of daylight. Um, so yeah, so I said goodbye to him and then I, um, I put on my micro spikes. I had my gaiters on and I, I prepared to make my way up this, uh, this, uh, slope, um, of this basically a vertical snowfield. 
this is another opportunity for you to reset and reevaluate where you are. Um, did it ever occur to you when you ran into that skier that you should turn around at that point? No, because I still had about six hours of daylight and I, I figured I can at least get up the snow field. And that was just my main goal. I just want to get up to the snow field. I want to see how far I can go. Um, I'll give myself, uh, I'll give myself three hours before I turn around because then I know that I'll have three hours to get back down. I at least just want to get down, uh, this scrambling section. And then once I can get down that on, I know that I'll be okay. Yeah. Yeah. So you calculated in your mind what, Mm -hmm. how you're going to be able to do this, then what happens? As I'm going up this hill, like I'm, I'm really tired, like more tired than I usually am during hikes. Um, but I just figured like, you know, I can, I can do this. I've done this before. I just have to hustle up this. Um, so I'm going up it and, um, I finally get up to the top. Uh, and by the time that I do get up to the top, uh, it's maybe about, um, 0.8 miles or so away from the summit. So I, I believe that this, se- this section was what they call the false, su- the false summit. Um, there might have been some others that were a little bit further up, but, um, so I get to an area where I'm able to see, uh, Mount Adams in the distance. Um, and I look down, I have a great view. I'm able to see, um, I see the snow field, uh, I see the, the snow field in front of me. And then I see, um, I'm able to see the, um, uh, the, area that I traversed. I see like that scrambling area. I see the monitoring stations. Um, I see, uh, just the forest below and it's, it's a gorgeous view as it is. So I I just figured, you know, this is a good time to turn around regardless. Um, it's unsafe for me to try to go up to the summit at this point in the day. And also there was a cloud that was obscuring the rest of the, uh, the trail to get there. So I just figured it would be really unsafe for me to try to walk through this cloud to get to, uh, to get to the, the rim. All right. So at this point, you decide to turn around and head back down. Yes. What time of day was it? Uh, so this was around 6 or 6.30. Okay. So you had some time before the sun set. Yes. I still had about three hours or so. Um, so another aspect of this is that I was terrified about glissading. If you're not a mountaineer, glissading is an efficient way to get down a mountain quickly. It's kind of like sledding. You sit down with your legs pointing down the mountain and let gravity do the rest. Climbers will use an ice axe or trekking poles to control speed and stop in an emergency. But Melissa wasn't confident in her glissading game, so she was hoping to find another way down. She found another trail that leads to a monitoring station on the volcano, and she hoped it would meet up with the original trail further down the mountain. I was uh, just traversing this landmass, and then eventually I get a bit closer to this monitoring station, and I realize there's there's no point where there, where these two trails are going to intersect. In fact, they're just going further apart. And I I later learned uh, after talking with Taylor Feldman, who is a guide at Mount St. Helens Institute, which is a nonprofit uh, where they have uh, they have guided services and they also do education at Mount St. Helens. I spoke with her after my hike and she told me that that was the um, that was the monitor uh, trail and or the monitor ridge trail, which is the traditional summer trail. And so if I had gone down that trail, I would have been two miles away from where I parked my car. And that's a a very common mistake for a lot of people. Usually when they get lost, they end up going down that trail. Now it's getting later in the day, and Melissa only has one option at this point. She hurries back up this trail and crosses back over the snowfield. And then she's faced with the one thing she was hoping to avoid. As I'm trying to hike down, I end up slipping a little bit just because the snow is is hard and icy. So I just figured I'm going to have to glissade down this. So... I'm glissading down, and um, at one point I started to get a little bit scared because I felt like I was going a little bit faster than I wanted to, and I tried to self-arrest um, by turning my body around in midair, but I just couldn't. And so, um, so then I just ended up sticking my uh, my my tra- my uh, trekking pole into the ground, and that's how I stopped. And I, I eventually figured out a way to just control my speed as, uh, through my trekking pole, and. Eventually, when I just let go, I, I had fun with it. So, um, so I managed to get to uh, the bottom of that, um, and then comes the part where I have to I have to scramble again. And at some point, you had to make a big decision, which was to stay. 
overnight. Yeah, so that decision came around the time when I got to, when I finished glissading. Um, I am going down this slippery uh, area where I have to scramble and where I already know that if I fall, this could tear me up, that this pumice rock could tear me up. So I just breathed and I, I asked myself, like, what is the best, uh, what's the best next step for myself given the information that I have and the state that I'm in? And like my, like a voice inside of myself is just like, you need to stop. You have to stop moving. You're going to injure yourself. You're going to injure yourself if you keep moving. So I just uh, accepted that and I decided I have to set up for the night. Um, and the whole time I was just thinking also, like I was just so embarrassed that this had happened to me. I went out to write a story about this hike and now I'm becoming the story. Um, but I just had to put all of my pride away and just figure out the, the next be best steps for myself. And that was to bed down for the night and you had an emergency blanket with you. You had some supplies. Tell me what you did to spend the night and, and how that went for you. Yeah, so I found a few boulders where it was, uh, they were large enough to, to block the wind. Um, and there was a little section where it looked like it was, it was sort of a cove where I was, I was thinking like, oh, okay, my, my head could fit in there. And I gathered some large rocks and then I put them, um, I positioned the shelter. Um, I like pinned down the rocks um, so that the, the emergency, the emergency shelter uh, made this sort of makeshift tent I was really concerned about my my uh, feet um, because I uh, just knew that they were going to be on the ground at night. So I wanted to keep them as warm as possible. So um, I squeezed, I like made sure that my, my feet were dry and I squeezed them into one wool sock. And then I put my one um, hand warmer in there and then I, I squeezed another, uh, another wool sock on top of it. So my feet were uh, like sitting on top of each other so that they could keep each other warm. Um, eventually I started to doze off a little bit. Um, and so I, I think I dozed off maybe a couple of times. Um, and then around, uh, and then around four or 30 or, or five or so, uh, I, I decided to pack up all of my stuff and I, and I left. How long did it take you to get down the mountain the next day? Uh, it took me about three hours. You yeah. made the right choice. It sounds like bedding down for the night. I think I did. I had a lot of people email me who disagreed with every single step that I took. Um, but Everyone's a critic. <laughs> yeah. I had someone uh, email me who does search and rescue, and he told me that, he, that I made the right choice because a lot of hikers, they end up uh, continuing to move and putting them, putting, making a poor situation even worse. So that was very validating for me uh, that that I made the right move by by hunkering down, and I, I got down without injury. I had um, a couple scratches on my hand, which I think I would have gotten regardless. But uh, otherwise, I was okay, just tired. So you ended up writing about this because that was the original intent, anyway. And in your piece, you said the summit humbled you. Tell me what you learned from this. Yeah, so I think I learned uh, first and foremost that I need to create better boundaries for myself with work. I also learned that I need to take the outdoors very seriously. Um, this moment also reminded me of all the other times that I've taken r risk when I've been outside and I ended up okay just because I was lucky. So this was a reminder that um, every time that I'm outside that I need to remember just how vulnerable I am and that I could always be in a life or death situation. You know, Melissa, I'm really glad you're saying all this. But from my perspective, listening to you, you sound far more prepared than most of the people that I run into in the woods. So this should be a, a warning for most people, because even someone who had the 10 essentials, who is an experienced hiker, got into a situation that could have really gone any way. I think also because so many people are wanting to get outside, there are a lot of novice hikers and there are a lot of people who are getting themselves into situations um, where maybe they don't have the gear or uh, the weather might turn at any moment. Um, and so I, I know that at, at Mount Rainier, for instance, there has been more um, more people who have been lost and uh, more calls for search and rescue than ever before. There's been an unprecedented amount of deaths. Um, so I just want people to be careful out there this summer. 
Um, also, I this is something that I'm planning on doing is getting a satellite system so that uh, if I ever do need help, that I'm able to dial SOS so I can uh, get someone to, to come out to get me. Melissa Hellman, staff writer for the Seattle Times. Great to talk to you. So glad you're okay. Thanks so much, Patricia. I'm glad that I'm okay, too. Thanks for listening to Seattle Now. If you learned something, share this episode with a friend. Matt Martin produced today's show. Our production team is Caroline Chamberlain Gomez, Claire McGrain, Diana O'Pong, and Jason Pagano. Matt Jorgensen does our theme music. I'm Patricia Murphy. See you tomorrow. 